Peter Brennan, the one of the co-founders of Heaps Normal Zero Alcohol Beer brand. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to Build It Thou Come. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Helen. Now, I have to say to you, non-alcoholic beer, it's really an oxymoron in Australia, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, it's um, <laughs> it's it's a strange one to explain to people who are not aware of it. Sometimes, um, yeah, it's. Uh, it but I mean, beer in Australia, you know, it's always for two hundred years. It's been full strength pretty much, although we've had uh, low alcohol beers, obviously, in the last several decades. But zero yeah. alcohol beer. Tell me where that idea came from, Peter. Um, the idea came from kind of two two areas really one was um um a very personal level to me my dad was a pretty abusive alcoholic i lost him to suicide when i was 11 years old and kind of grew oh, up in the I'm shadow so of that sorry my to whole hear life that. and no don't be silly it's all good I, I talk about this stuff openly i wear my heart on my sleeve and i've kind of i've dealt with all the demons around that so it's all good and and um yeah totally cool to chat about it um so there was a very personal connection for me and i think subsequently I never had a good relationship with alcohol growing up in my 20s. I was the guy who would, you know, be the life of the party and then couldn't remember getting home and upset people that I cared about and, you know, um, got myself into trouble. And, and, you know, the older I got, I'm, you know, I'm 41. I'm happily married with three beautiful children and just realized it kind of dawned on me a few years ago that, um, you know, I definitely had a, an itch I needed to scratch from that perspective. So that was kind of the one part of it. The other part of it was... Um, but Peter, kind of sorry, just staying, sorry, just staying with that point, are you mm. saying that you felt maybe you were heading along the same path as your dad and abusing alcohol too much? Yeah, potentially. I think, um, you know, back in back in the day, there wasn't as much talk around, you know, can, like alcohol consumption and mental health issues and things like that. And I was finding the older that I was becoming, I was starting to question my choice in certain things. You know, I, I got to a point where I were, I knew that alcohol was an issue for me. So did I avoid social occasions altogether or did I go out and pretend I had an ear infection that I'd been pretending for the last six months that wasn't going away and that was my excuse to not have a beer, you know? So, um, yeah, it was definitely scratching an itch. And, and, you know, like I was saying on the same side of things, um, at the same time, I, I run a branding studio uh, called Electric and Analog, and we create and reinvent consumer brands. And, um, you know, three years in, had a little bit of imposter syndrome. Could we create a brand on our own without a client telling us what they thought was the right thing to do? So had this real kind of desire to create a brand the way that I thought a brand could be created. And, um, yeah, the stars aligned and it, it turned into what we now know as Heaps Normal. Oh, look, it's extraordinary. We'll get into a couple of those points that you've raised, but you're on a mission. So the website says, and I've read a lot of what you've all been talking about, you're on a mission to normalize mindful drinking. What does that mean in your view, Peter? Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting one because I think we all have, you know, everybody's different and we all have different relationships with alcohol and what we think is normal and you know one of the reasons that we call the business heaps normal is because we want to we want to challenge what normal is to a lot of people you know um for some people normal is going out and having eight beers and you know not remembering how you got home and and missing work the next day and for other people normal is going out and having a coffee at in the evening and not drinking alcohol so we've we've always you know when we started the business we kind of we did the research and we realized that you know People don't respond well to being told what to do. So we've never been preachy about alcohol consumption. We've never said alcohol's the devil, don't drink. We've just said, hey, find what works for you and, you know, reinvent what normal means to you. And um, I think that's been a big part of why people are resonating with what we're doing as a brand and as a business. So how did you four friends get together? Because there were four of you and you, you forged ahead with the idea to not only brew your own beer, but to have no alcohol in it. How did that come about? And did you all bring different things to the table? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of knocked on a few doors in the early days and, and got politely laughed out of boardrooms and was told it would never be a thing. And, um, you know, it, there wasn't really much interest for that. Um, the first person that took me seriously was my co-founder and our CEO, whose name is Andy Miller. 
um, he got it straight away. He just went, yep, I see the vision. I, I understand what you're trying to do. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm all in. So um, I done Was a little bit a of work with Andy before. Or, right, or and, yeah, more a colleague. Yeah, and, yeah more of a um, – we'd, we'd done – um, Andy used to work at Young Henry's in Sydney, and um, we've right. done some work with them as a branding studio. So, um, you know, him and I got to know each other a little bit through that. He'd since left the company and was consulting, and the timing worked out really well for him. Um, and then we needed someone who who could, you know, make beer. So we reached out to Benny Holdstock, who had worked with Andy at, at Young Henry's as well. And, um, you know, Benny's an incredible brewer. He's worked at the likes of Grifter and Four Pines and you know, like I said, Young Henry's and Little Creatures and a few others. And um, he was the guy that really came in and kind of went, okay, this is a challenge. Like I've never made a beer without any alcohol before, but he, you know, he took it by, but he took the bull by the horns and, and, and moved forward and created a beer that has, um, you know, just under 0.5% alcohol, which anything under that can be classified as non-alcoholic. So, um, to give you some perspective, a ripe banana can have 0.5% alcohol. Um, oh, really? A of orange I didn't juice know that. In the fridge. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The, 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 the sugars just ferment and, and naturally right. make under 0.5% alcohol. So that's uh, we, we use a very particular yeast that micro ferments just under that so we don't take anything out, which is the, the, the kind of historical way of making non-out beer. Um and we pulled in Geordie Smith, who I've known since we were children. We used to surf with each other when we were kids. And um, the four of us kind of went to town and we made we made 1,200 blank cans and we put a sticker on them and sent them out as far and wide as we could to people in the hospitality industry. And we got um, we got a, we got a, a very common response. So people would, sit, would drink it and they go, this is delicious. And they'd start naming all the flavor profiles. And then we'd say, what, what alcohol percent do you think this is? And they'd say, four four and a half five percent and then we said it's non-alcoholic and we just saw jaws hit the floor and people couldn't quite believe it and um i think that's when we realized we were potentially onto something right so again we'll get into a bit more detail of all that but but essentially you're saying you didn't and you don't have to remove the alcohol it's never in there in the first place Correct. So the typical way, there's two typical ways to make non-alcoholic beer, which is traditionally how beer, like non-alcoholic beers are, has been around since the 1970s. It's yeah. nothing new. So um, you can either boil the alcohol off at the end, um, or you could do this kind of vacuum reverse osmosis, um, vacuum distillation, it's called. And the problem with both of those is it takes a lot of the flavors and the ingredients out at the end. So typically a lot of the Right. More traditional non-alcoholic beers are quite watered down a little bit. You know, a, a beer connoisseur would argue that it's lost all its flavor and tastes yeah. like fizzy water, which definitely didn't do the category any flavors, um, any favors, should I say. Um, and what we did, we kind of really innovated on the production process. So we, we follow pretty much the same process as producing normal beer. It has all the same ingredients. We just don't take anything out at the end. We use a, a, a yeast that micro ferments just under 0.5%. So nothing's taken out and it allows you to have this full flavored mouthfeel of, a, of a, what you would call a normal alcoholic beer um, without the alcohol. Right. Now, your website rather playfully says, a designer, a brewer, a pro surfer and a ginger walk into a bar. Now, which one are you? I'm the designer, even though I do have a ginger beard coming through between the white hairs. Um, yeah, my, my background's design. I've, I, I've studied graphic design straight out of school um, and I've kind of, you know, built my career around around being a designer. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm currently head of brand. I'm one of the co-founders at Heaps Normal and I guess everything brand kind of falls on my head in a way, but we all we all kind of work together as a team. We've got a, we've got 23 staff now and, you know, the four of us are co-founders are very active in the business. So, um, yeah, it's definitely a team effort. Yeah, amazing. What made you think, let's just go back to the beginning again, what made you think that Australia was ready for a zero alcohol beer? I mean, did you actually do any real market research? We did. We didn't, we didn't pay a research agency to go out and do that kind of stuff. I think... Um, you know, as an as an early stage entrepreneur, there's there's some magic and na naivety and having a gut feeling and things. I travel a lot for work. I've been to the US uh, quite a few times in Japan on business and recognised that there was a, a kind of growing movement of um, younger people in particular um, in Tokyo and LA, for example, that were cutting down their alcohol consumption. Um, 
when going out. And that was, you know, a, a real big kind of factor for us to consider. Um, and we did the research and realized, you know, alcohol costs the economy billions of dollars a year in terms of disease and car accidents and domestic violence and all that kind of stuff. So we, we, we really felt in our heart there was something there. And like I said, we all had different reasons as well, you know, like um, not, not all of us had alcoholism in the family, but Geordie Smith, for example, as a co-founder, he's a, he's a pro surfer. He's a, you know, consistently top five in the, on the world tour in the last few years. And for him, he wanted to have a competitive edge. You know, he wanted to, He's come runner up to being the world champion twice and he wanted to have wow. that competitive edge that would allow him to win the world title. Um, you know, with Benny it was the meaning very much sorry, the he just doesn't want to hang he, Yeah, he just he just didn't want the hangover the next day, but still wanted to be social, wanted to have Correct. the flavour and the taste of beer. Yeah, exactly. I think I think as a society we've become kind of you know, conditioned that we, we have a drink, you know, we drink to commiserate, we drink to celebrate and everything in between. Um, and it's just become part of our DNA as humans yeah. you know, in, in the Western world. We just, we grew, we grow up and we see mom and dad having a glass of wine with dinner and we just think it's normal. And, you know, we're, we're challenging that, you know, it doesn't have to be normal yeah. to go out and drink alcohol and not remember things in the morning. What were the other two's motivations? Um, so uh, Andy's traveled a lot. He, um, he's done some wild things. He traveled through China in his pajamas, amongst other crazy things. So he's fascinated <laughs> with, uh, with, with culture change. And, and, and he definitely saw that as a, as a challenge that he wanted to kind of tackle and, and take on board. And, you know, for Benny, um, you know, as, as a production, as a brewer, um, you know, we were under the, um, you know, the, I guess the opinion that there wasn't any good non-up beers out there. So we wanted to try and mm. make one that tasted really good and people thought it was a normal beer and could enjoy it in the same way. Yeah. So Peter, take me back to that beginning time. Were you almost laughed out of town? Yeah, kind of. I, I met with three established breweries um, through our network and walked in with a pitch deck and an idea and kind of sold them on the size of the market and the branding and everything else and was, you know, politely told this probably isn't going to work. And, you know, it's a n nice idea, but it w there wouldn't really be a market for it. Um, but, you know, like a dog without a bone, I just couldn't let it go and, and, and kept barking up the wrong trees until I found the right tree, <laughs> which was, which was Mr. Andy Miller. And um, yeah, here we are. We we turned two at the end of this month. So we were still very, very early days, but um, you know, the, the business has gone from strength to strength and we're, we're super excited. Yeah. So just to be clear, did you actually want to be beer brewers first and foremost, or was it really this idea to make a beer with no alcohol that was the driving force at the start? It was definitely the latter. We don't want to make normal alcoholic beer. I don't think it's ever going to be part of our DNA. We're a dedicated non-alcoholic beer company. Um, you know, when when we kind of went to, went to market, there, there wasn't, Carlton Zero wasn't live yet by any means it was uh it was probably you know just about to be launched and it kind of launched just before we did and um but we've always been a dedicated non-alcoholic beer company um we've, we've got two s kind of core SKUs in our range we've done a, a special release as well and as we build out that that portfolio of beers they're they're all going to be absolutely non-alcoholic so yeah we, ne we never wanted to be a normal beer company that's for sure so what's the difference between your two beers that you have out now our first product is called the Quiet XBA, which is an extra pale ale. It's kind of the typical fruity, you know, what you'd expect from a craft beer company. Right. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's exceeded all of our expectations. It's, it's won gold at the World Beer Awards. For best Congratulations. Um, Amazing, really. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, that, that's all on Benny as I head brewer for sure. But, um, yeah, we're really proud of that one. Um, it also, it was the highest um, – ranking on the Gab's Hottest 100, which is the equivalent of the Emmy Awards, you know, for the beer industry. It, it ranked um, number 20, which is the highest, you know, by far non-alcoholic beer, um, which is really exciting. Well, and, and then our ranked, second beer is... Sorry, ranked in popularity, taste or sales? Yeah, it's a, it's kind of a, it's a, a popularity competition, to, to be honest. Right. Um, so 
you know, Gab's um, launched this, this Hottest 100 event every year and, um, you know, all the beer companies submit who they their beers that they want to put forward and then they reach yep. out to the community and, and everybody votes. So, uh, yeah, our XPA came in at number 20, um, which, you know, Brilliant. beating essentially 80 other alcoholic beers, which is really exciting. Um, and then, yeah, our second product is called Another Lager, which is more of a traditional kind of, um, you know, old school lager type beer. Um, and we launched that at the end of last year as well. And that's um, that's really starting to take off now too. So we're just grateful that people are really getting behind what we're doing. Yeah. I just wonder if you could explain a little bit more about this, this idea behind well, your messages, which are very clever. You're not telling people don't drink or you must be sober. It's much more subtle than that, but you are saying don't get wasted on alcohol. How did you think through these messages and, and sort of come to what you would then market yourselves as? Yeah, look, I think for me it comes down to the fundamental realisation that if you tell somebody what to do, they're probably not going to listen to you. you know? and, and I always use two, two polarising examples of that. My little boy is four. If I say don't touch that hot plate, he's 100% touching the hot plate no matter what. Um, and then on the macro scale, you know, you look at what the government are doing with smoking cigarettes. They've been telling us to stop smoking yeah. cigarettes for years, but no, people still smoke cigarettes, you know. So we kind of, well, we it kind has of looked at it and went, all right, it has, it has. But a lot of people, you know, generally speaking, people just don't like to be told what to do. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, when we launched, we thought very, very clearly, we don't want to be preaching sobriety. We don't want to be telling people not to drink. So we've always said we love we make people we make beer for people who love a beer but they want to cut down their alcohol consumption that could be for the night because they're driving it could be for life because they identify as sober or it could be anything in between those two things and you know people are really resonated with what the brand stands for and they've really got behind us which is really exciting yeah so the narrative or the story is really important to you guys but do you think young men in particular, but young women to think about those sorts of things as they're deciding whether to go for heaps normal or something else when they're buying it in the bottle shop? Yeah, look, I think, you know, people buy into brands that they identify with and they 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 believe in. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's wonderful that our product itself is, um, has won all sorts of awards and, and the like. Um, but our brand's done really well too, you know, like we've... Um, we, we were recognized by Interbrand, one of the biggest global branding agencies in the world, as a breakthrough brand last year. Um, we've won a number of awards, uh, awards in the last couple of months or last few months for, for brand work as well. Um, to answer your question, um, it, it's, a very, it's a very interesting journey for us as a brand because we hear these incredible stories from our community day in, day out. And there's been a few in particular um, that, I, that I kind of like to bring to the forefront. One is... Um, you know, in the early days, we had an, we still got this, an independent bottle shop that lives it's down the road from where I live, and we're good friends with the owners. And we were kind of popping in to see how it was going. And the lady behind the counter said, Oh, the strangest thing happened. You know, on Friday, these four young guys came in in their late teens, early 20s, and they were scanning the fridge for what beer to you to, to, to buy for the Friday night. And um, they, they all picked up a four pack of Heaps Normal. And she thought to herself, They've fallen for the branding. They don't realize it's non alcoholic. Let me, flagged it and let them know so she just went guys just to let you know this is non-alcoholic they all for all four of them went yep we understand we're we're landscape gardeners we've got to work in wow. the morning. we want to go for a surf before work but we're going to a house party tonight so the younger Fantastic. generation are picking up on yeah. it yeah it's really it's really great you know um it then we had another story of a bottle shop where an old man came in and looked really downcast and you know the bottle shop owner said are you okay and he goes no i've just come back from the doctor and he said i can't drink anymore so i'm gonna die and he said um you know you got to understand i've got four friends our wives have passed away we go to the no. pub at four o'clock every day and we we drink beers and we, we that's our church you know and then we go home and we feed our dogs and we have dinner and we go to bed and that's our daily routine and we can't do mm. that anymore so he sold him a four pack of heaps normal and he came back the next day and bought a four pack for his mates and they came in and bought a case for themselves and the pub they go to is now a customer of ours. Um, so there's kind of this, this kind of like age 
breach from young to mm. old. Pregnant women. I had no idea pregnant women love non-alcoholic beer as much as they do. We get weekly messages from, from you know, women who are pregnant going, I, I thought I couldn't go to the pub with my friends on the weekend. Now I can because Heaps Normal is served at my favorite pub. So it's definitely breaking down barriers. It's definitely exceeding expectations. And, um, you know, I think the product and the brand together, they've just kind of married in a, in a way where it's a, a, a real perfect, perfect sum of all parts. Yeah. So, Peter, what you're saying is there's just – it's actually a seismic shift really going on. Can you I- explain it in that, you know, Australia has had such a drinking culture. And as you said mm. at the outset, you know, it's always associated with our footy grand finals or the Grand Prix wins, the sport. So being healthy in sport and yet it's always associated with alcohol and it, it's almost a rite of passage to get, you know, wasted Um that sort of thing. But are you saying you're really seeing a big shift in that? I am, yeah. I, I, I do believe there's a big shift in that and the, the data backs it up. Um, you know, I think people are very conscious of what they put into their body these days, um, yeah. whether that's food or drink. You know, the health and wellness trend in general is, is really exploding. Um, as awful as it sounds to say this, I think COVID really worked in our favour. You know, the first lockdown People went to Dan Murphy's and stocked up and drank their way through it. And the second lockdown, they said, we can't do that again. And, um, you know, our timing was just, it was what it was. You know, we were there and and people kind of tried heaps normal and they they identified they enjoyed it as much as a normal beer. And um, I think it's definitely shifting. You know, the mindset is shifting. because I think our drinking culture is broken fundamentally. We'll get to COVID in a moment because I just want to still stay right at the beginning. Um, I mean, when did the idea between the four of you take hold and how much experimentation did you have to do with the brewing, with the tastes and the flavours before you settled on a product? And when did you put that first product out? Yeah, so we, um, I think, you know, the four of us as co-founders, we, Within the first few meetings of kind of sitting down with each other, we realized we wanted to be on this journey together, which, which, was, which was really wonderful, you know, for, for a, a startup co-founder to realize that there's three other people around him that, you know, are all aligned and, and want yeah. to be on that, on that journey together is great. So um, that kind of took off straight away. Um, in terms of the, the process, yeah, I mean, Benny, Benny's a wizard, you know, he, um, he has this pretty detailed home set up in his kitchen of how to make beer and that's where things start. And, um, really in the you know, kitchen, 50 liters. Yeah, literally. Um, you know, it's, it's how, it's how he tinkers and he, you know, um, tests and, and refines and, and, you know, gets that feedback loop going. And it's, it's really interesting because he'll taste a, a warm, um, you know, flat, unfizzy, uncarbonated version of the beer and go, this is delicious. And I'll taste it and, and nearly spit it out. But, um, you know, he's he's got a very educated palate and he knows that once it's scaled to production sizes and carbonated and cooled down, it will taste good. And to his credit, it's worked every time. And then when did you put your first product out and how long did that whole experimentation process take? Yeah, so the Quiet XBA, we launched it um, at the end of July 2020. So in the wow. next few weeks, we will we'll, we'll be kind of two years in, in market, which is which is an exciting milestone for us. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it we 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 brewed the beer the, um, the beer in, in silver cans initially, and we put stickers on them, and um, like I said, we hand deliver them to restaurateurs and sommeliers around Sydney that we knew and further abroad, and. Um, yeah, the, the feedback was overwhelming. So we, we decided to, uh, you know, all put some money in and scale that from a home brew to, to a production brew with our brew partner. And um, it, it kind of went from strength to strength. Right. So you came up with the recipe and as you say, it was home brewed for the perhaps, what, the first batch. Then mm-hmm. you get a brewing company in Victoria to actually brew it for you. You don't have your own brewery. Is that right? Yeah, we yeah we kind of we turn the traditional business of building a beer company a little bit on its head. I, I think how a lot of breweries start is they're very capital intensive in the early days, and they, um, you know, they build a they build a, a brewery, and it's it costs a lot of money, and then fingers crossed people will come, yeah. um, build it, they'll come. Yeah, um, <laughs> and um, you know, we did it the other way around. We 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 contract brewed with our brew partner. We also, um, you know, a real big pivotal moment in our business was getting accepted into Startmate. 
um, which is the accelerator program run by Blackbird Ventures, which is typically a typically a technology skewed accelerator program. Yeah. But, um, yeah, we um, we were invited to apply. We were told we probably wouldn't get in, but it would be good for us to think about our business in a different way. So we went through the application process of, I believe, 700 plus startups, and we got narrowed down to you know one of the final 12 and went into the went into the program. And off the back of that, raised some money with some some incredible investors. And um, you know those same investors followed on in the last round that we did at the end of last year. And we're now building our own brewery and. Um, you know, growing the business, which is really exciting. E- extraordinary. Now, so keeping the flavour and the taste for beer lovers, I mean, that must be the holy grail, obviously. But mm-hmm. does zero alcohol beer have less sugar in it or more sugar in it than normal beer? It's got about half the sugar and calories of a normal beer. So it's, a, it's fantastic it's as well. Yeah. So yeah. that's an added benefit, right? <laughs> it is. Yeah. Where did the funding come from at the very beginning? Did you have a bit of savings, each of you? Did you borrow from family or borrow from a bank or did you max out the credit card? Yeah, we. Um, the, well, the first round is called the three Fs, friends, family and fools. Um, so <laughs> we, we – um, yeah, we, we all put some money in pretty early on. And, um, you know, Geordie was, was essentially our first investor. He put he – put, quite a substantial amount of money down and really got behind us. And um, yeah, that allowed us to do our first production run. It allowed us to, you know, do a lot of R and D in the early days before we did that production run and, and essentially make something that was our version of, you know, what the tech world calls an MVP, a minimum viable product. And that's what we used to sample and, and get people's opinions. And from there we were able to scale. So. F- fantastic. Now you launched your first batch in winter at the start, at, in that first year of the pandemic, was that a little bit mad? Probably, but it worked <laughs> out. Um, it's, um, I, I think, you know, like I said, I, I think hard work is one thing, but I think being in the right place at the right time, I think mm. a little bit of luck, I think a little bit of know-how and, um, you know, network and, and all those things really play into the success of any company. And, um, you know, we, we, you know, we've worked really hard, but I think, you know, we've been surrounded by incredible people from the beginning. And I think, you know, like you called out, the timing of COVID was something that was obviously out of our control, but it seemed to work in our favor for some reason. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said earlier, I think it's just this kind of perfect storm of, of, of timing and hard work and luck and a bit of research and blood, sweat and tears that all came together and has allowed us to you know, be where we are now, which in the grand scheme of things, we're not even, you know, we're barely two years in. We still have a lot of work ahead of us. But, um, yeah, it feels like we're doing good stuff. And, you know, for me, it's it's it, it really is a purpose-driven business. You know, like I, I shared my, my story with my dad earlier. And, you know, we get we get messages weekly from people through our social media, through the email address on our website going, you know, my husband – was not a nice person and he's mm. found heaps normal and now I enjoy his company and my dad stopped being angry with me wow. because of heaps normal and all these things where, you know, when it's, when it's midnight and you're trying to work through a presentation, but you know, you should go to bed. It's those things for me that kind of make you push through and make you want to get out of bed in the morning because we're doing, you know, we're making a product that I think was frowned at a lot in the early days, but now people are really understanding why we're doing it and, and you know, why we're doing it is everything. Yeah. So you talked about, you know, the timing. I mean, um, you're, you're giving COVID, uh, some great, um, you know, the various lockdowns really helped you. Is that because you think there was this reassessment of, of how we live through COVID and that we can't depend on, um, alcohol to get us through? Yeah, absolutely. Like I, like I said earlier, I think, you know, the first lockdown, people just stocked up and they drank through it because they thought this is going to be for a couple of weeks. Let's bunker down and get it done. And, you know, we're off work for a, for a few days. And um, and I think when it dawned on us all that this was not something that was going to go away too quickly, yeah. um, you know, people started reassessing their, their relationship with alcohol and other things, you know, fitness in general or food. Um, I, I think it's I think it's there's been opportunity for a lot of companies in those spaces to do really well. Um, in a downturn like we like we've experienced yeah peter as you mentioned before in november 
2021, so what, seven or eight months ago, you raised $8.5 million in a funding round, mainly from private individuals like Adore Beauty's Kate Morris, who's been on this podcast as well. How important is that funding in your growth? Yeah, it's been really important for us. Um, you know, coming through that Start Made Accelerator program, a lot of our mentors were people like Kate Morris and, um, you know, Danny Millen from Koala and Milk Run and oh, people like great Simon to Griffiths. Hear. From, yeah, people like Simon Griffiths from Who Gives a Crap. And, and, and you know, the, those having access to those people as mentors was invaluable for us. And, and when we, you know, how it works with Start Made is you get to the end of the accelerator and then it's essentially a Dragon's Den style pitch competition where you, you know, you go on stage and you say, this is our business and we need X amount of money to do these three or four things with. And you kind of open it up to the floor. And I think if I remember correctly, we needed $1.2 million back then. We opened the round on that demo day and within 48 hours, we had $1.8 million committed. So we had to scale a bunch of investors back. And um, I think we settled on like 1.3 or 1.4. And then when we, when we did this, uh, the series A raise back in November, um, we, I think there was two or three people that were outside of the initial investment group, but the rest of the investors were people that had followed on from the first round. So it's, I guess, just so grateful that we've surrounded ourselves with such incredible people who have built businesses from scratch very successfully. Um, and then, you know, can see the vision that we're trying to achieve and have put their money where their mouths are and backed us from, from the early days, which is just, you know, so we're so grateful for that. Yeah, Peter, I just want to ask you, uh, I mean, that funding, that particularly the um, the Series A, that valued the company at, what, just under $60 million, which is amazing for having sold your first products in mid-2020. But do you think those valuations of late last year were a little bit frothy and could come off a bit now? I don't think so. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things, I think, raising money is often – misunderstood you know we 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 raised like i said we raised a total of nearly 10 million dollars and at each raise you get people phoning you going congratulations and it's actually the opposite because no one just gives you money yeah. <laughs> you've got to pay that yeah. money back with a return of course a certain time period so if anything it's um you know the pressure's really on um but yeah i mean we're we're, we're going from strength to strength um you know we we were very clear on what we we're going to use the funding for um you know which was to you know some key hires to increase production and, and build our own facility which we're kind of working through at the moment um but yeah we're just so grateful we've got some incredible people in our corner and it's um yeah it's just it's really exciting to have access to those people yeah so back when you started was it always for you a big vision or was it Oh, let's just try this. I've got an itch. I need to scratch it, see where it goes. Um, I think anyone who has started a business before will probably tell you that you need to have a big vision for it. Um, you know, just dipping your toe in the water. It's never how I've really done things. It's always kind of all in and let's just go full hog and see how far we can get this. And I think, um, you know, to have that vision, like, I'm, I, you know, our mission is to change drinking culture. It's a really big, hairy, audacious goal. And wow. there's a lot of work that goes into that. So, um, yeah, we've, we've, we've always, we've always kind of viewed this thing as, as, you know, going large where we're currently exploring, um, you know, other options as well. We're, we're, we're building out the range even more. We're looking at, selling the beer further abroad um, overseas as well, which is really exciting. So, yeah, it's, um, Any it's definite never been Any plans a... about that? Well, we're on shelf in Malaysia, Hong Kong, Singapore, New Zealand at the moment. Oh, um, brilliant. And we're in, yeah, and we're in, we're in conversation with a few other distributors in some other key areas. So, um, yeah, I'll let you know. Yeah. So, Peter, how did that scale up and growth go? Because how did it actually happen in the beginning? Was it um, you guys cold calling, you know, at bottle shops and, and restaurateurs? And um, was it social media influences? Was it traditional media? Yeah, it was probably a mix of everything. You know, like I said, the early days, um, you know, we had 1,200 plain blank silver cans in my kitchen upstairs that my daughter and my wife and I hand pain, hand stakingly put painstakingly put hand applied stickers on and into plastic, into paper bags with um, people's names on them. And we handed them out to, you know, Maryvale group and all the independents and, um, you know, 
kind of these aspirational yeah, so you places basically where had wanted to, to be in. Yeah, you had to cold call them. I mean, maybe did, yeah. the young Henry's yeah. guys had a few contacts, but, um, you know, you still had to, what, pick up the phone and say, you should try this product. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, just that, that kind of blind taste test for us was everything. Not not telling people it's non-alcoholic until they tried it was, was re- really the mic drop moment for us where, you know, almost everyone who tried it could not believe it was non-alcoholic. And that's when we knew we had something. Yeah. How difficult was it to crack those big distributors that you got? You're in BWS, you're in Dan Murphy's, you're in Liquorland. Was that difficult to crack and how did you do it? Yeah, I think, you know, we would we were told pretty early on if we wanted to go into the big supermarkets and the chains that we'd have to have four or five years run on the board and we'd have to go knocking on their door and they, they wouldn't let us in for six months and then they'd haggle us down on price. And that wasn't our experience at all. You know, we um we kind of just stuck to our roots and what we wanted to do, which was, you know, to build a, a non-alcoholic beer company that would change drinking culture. And within eight months of launching, um, you know, we had the buyers of two of the biggest, you know, retailers in the country emailing us cold out of the blue within the space of two weeks saying they wanted to stock us. So, um, I wow. think, you know, yeah. And I, and I think that wasn't down to any crazy science that we planned out or mapped out. It was just serendipitous a little bit, but you know, at the same time we, we, like I said, you know, coming through start mate, we'd surrounded ourselves with these incredible individuals who are pretty yeah. well known in their respective spaces. And, um, we built up a really cool brand ambassador team in the early days of people like Cameron Murray and, Matt DeBoer and some really, you know, incredible people that we classify as three areas, which is artists, athletes, and entrepreneurs. And, um, yeah, I think, it, uh, you know, a lot of our growth was word of mouth and people just trying it and then, you know, choosing it by name and, and telling their friends about it. And, you know, within a few months we were, um, you know, we, we ran out of beer twice in the early days, which I think in the early days is good. Um, but as you mature, you really need to, you know, get that, that production forecast as right as you can yeah. because you don't want to be sitting yeah. on too much stock, but you can't sell out. Um, so these are all things that we've, you know, over the last two years plus we've managed to kind of juggle and figure out and are still trying to figure out, but we've, we've got some incredible people, you know, the, the buyers from all those big retailers, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's so incredible how helpful they are. They empathize that we're a young business. We, um, you know, pretty early on, we said, Hey, if we were going to deliver to all of your stores, we'd fall over you wouldn't be able to kind of ramp production that quickly. They understood that. They said, yep, we get it. We're, we're, why don't we do 100 stores this month? We'll do 150 the next month and kind of gradually scale with us. So it's been an absolute pleasure to work with those customers and and see that see heaps normal and, and on, on more shelves around the country. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear that about those big players. How many stores could you sort of put a figure on it? How many stores are you in now? We're in just, I believe, just over 4,000 venues around the country, which is bottle shops, supermarkets, um, you know, restaurants, off-license, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, four, four, four to 5,000 at the moment. Um, but, you know, that, that changes quite quickly with, a, with a, a big distributor that comes on board. So, yeah. Was there one step you took that really catapulted the business? Fourth, I think it was probably a lot of little steps. I mean, look, the um, the start made um, kind of yeah, the, the start made experience really, I think, changed the game for us in a really big way. Um, you know, we were we all of a sudden had access to some of the best mentors money could buy. Uh, we had a, a, a valuation because they'd invested in us. Um, so, if anything, I think coming through start made as an accelerator program was probably. The, the best thing that happened to us in the early days. Yeah. Peter, I mean, there are a lot of the big beer brands and the, the multinationals are all making zero alcohol beer now. They could crush you, couldn't they? Or have you sure. got a differentiating um, appeal that will allow you all to share the market? Yeah, look, I think you need to go into these things with an abundance mindset. I think there's enough of the pie to go around for everybody. And I think for me, um, you know, it's 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 two things. It's it's product and brand. You know, if you make a good product yeah. that people really enjoy, um, that is hard to to copy. 
Um, I think that's a really big tick for a company like us. And the other thing is brand. And I think, you know, it's hard to replicate brands. Someone could quite easily take a product and reverse engineer it and figure out how to make it. But, um, you know, people, people buy into brand. And, and I think what we've created as a, as a beer company is quite unique. I don't think it's very replicable. Um, and I think, you know, those two things together has allowed us to be a market leader, which is great. Do you think there's a key to making your business successful even so far? Sorry, the question is, do you think there's a key to making your business successful? What's been the key to making your business a success so far? Um, A lot of things, you know. We mentioned timing and luck and all that kind of stuff earlier, but I think on the day-to-day it's – you know, for us as founders and also the staff, you know, we've got 23 staff now within the business. And I think, you know, it's all very clear that this is a purpose driven business for them. They all have their own reasons. And look, we're not, don't get me wrong. We're not like, I don't drink alcohol. I haven't had a drink in 18 months because I realized it was not very good for me. Um, But, you know, a lot of the team do enjoy a drink and and we we definitely don't preach sobriety. But um, I, I mean, in terms of being a, being a key, I think it's just, being positive, being optimistic, having a very clear vision of what you want, surrounding yourselves with the right people, really believing in what you're doing. And I think if any of those things start to wane, that's when things can start to fall apart. So, um, you know, we keep ourselves in check. Um, We're we're not very ego driven. Um, We realize what we're doing has meaning and purpose. And like I said, those messages that we get from people in our community every now and again are just what makes it all worthwhile. How long did it take before you were profitable? Or are you still sort of getting to that point? I mean, obviously anything you make, I guess, goes back into the business. Yeah, we, we, we invest everything back into the business. I, I, I wouldn't want to go into too much detail on, on the financials on a, on a call like this because I think a lot of that stuff's confidential. But, um, but yeah, I mean, look, it's for us, it's it's about doing the right thing. You know, we've, um, we've, we, we spend a lot of money in making the beer. and um, but you know, we've, we've got some great customers out there too. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it all kind of comes full circle in the end. Yeah. Can you give us any idea of your sales? No. No. Okay. Fair enough. Have you ever come close to falling over or going broke? No, um, we haven't, you know, we've, like I said, we're, we're not even two years in, so we're very early days. Um, you know, we've, we've, we've been selling the beer since we kind of first did our first brew. And, um, you know, that's kind of gone from, from strength to strength month in month out. But I think, I think anyone who says they're not going to fall over at some point would be either naive or foolish. And I think, uh, we definitely, you know, um, as much as we look forward, we kind of look back and make sure that we do things better than we've done them before. And I think just trying to get better and doing it in a really honest way. And, um, you know, the way we're doing it, I think, is, is, is really working for us. So, Peter, what would be your markers of success right now for Heaps Normal and where you're at? Look, I, I, our goal from the beginning is to have a Heaps Normal in every fridge. Um, so that is the, you know, the, the, the big kind of vision that we have. Um, but, you know, in terms of markers, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a tricky question to answer. I think for me, it comes down to people – trying our product, people liking our product, people being being curious and inquisitive about what we're about and looking into that and then, you know, realizing that they identify with that in some way or form. And I think for me that's that's all we can really ask for. That's that's the stuff that gets me really excited. Can I just ask you, how did you learn to be a leader? And suddenly you're a leader with three other co founders, you've got all these big customers, uh, you've got a, a big scale up happening still and you're sort of in the midst of it. And what have you learned about yourself as a leader in these past two years? For Helen, that's a really good question. Um, I think, you know, um, always learning is the key. I think I think anyone who uh, thinks they know everything is going to be brought down to speed quite quickly. Um, you know, we still get things wrong daily you know we're still trying to figure things out but we've jumped in with both feet we've surrounded ourselves with people who are better than us in key areas that we might lack skills and expertise in um but i think you know being honest with it with each other 
we uh, we very much want the feedback. We ask for a lot of feedback from the team in terms of how we can improve. Um, you know, we've brought in tools like Culture Amp and things like that um, that really help us to create, I guess, a culture of people that believe in what we do and believe in the brand and the business. And, um, you know, that applies to us as co-founders as well. You know, um, we've all worked in the industry in some way or form for, for a long time. Um, this is my fourth business. Um, the other two, two of the earlier ones were complete failures. And I think there's a lot of learnings through that. But, um, but yeah, we're always learning and we're always trying to get better. And I think just having that approach and that attitude and not think you know everything is, is the key to improving and, and hopefully not falling over. Yeah. Just quickly, with those other businesses you started, um, you said you had a, a brand and design business, but were they manufacturing a product type businesses, the ones that didn't work? I had a, yeah, I had a, I had a clothing company when I was like early 20s that manufactured T-shirts that so were in about 30 something stores around around the country. Um, I had a tech startup called Viewpop that lets you capture three dimensional apps, which is more of a software business that we took to Web Summit in Dublin and made the top 10 of pitch competitions and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, there's definitely, we're, we're in a different league now with Heaps Normal. You know, we're, we're making a lot of beer. There's a lot of product shipping around the country. Um, there's all sorts of things that can go wrong <laughs> at every step of that process. Um, sure. So we're just, we, you know, we're managing it as best we can and we're, 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 we're giving it our best shot day in, day out. And, um, yeah, we're just, we're so happy that people are just getting behind it. Peter, just a few quick questions that I'm asking all cool. my guests. What are you obsessed about at the moment, be it a film, a book, a recipe, a cause? I'm obsessed about productivity and that comes down to um, being diagnosed with ADHD about 18 months ago um, as an adult and just oh, trying to understand really? that. So, um, yeah, so I'm I'm fascinated with productivity hacks and time blocking and minimizing distractions and things like that. I read a lot about it. I'm still terrible at it, at being productive. I'm, I'm a constant work in progress, but um, it's something that I'm just so interested in and trying to get right. And how are you dealing with the diagnosis of ADHD? Yeah, good. Um, try to try to few different bits of medication that weren't right for me <laughs> um, and it just come down to, you know, that's one of the reasons I quit alcohol. I'm, I'm very conscious of my sleep. I used to go to the Gary Vaynerchuk school of hustle where you didn't need to sleep and just work every waking hour. And it dawned on me a year or so ago that that's um, not the, not the most effective way to operate. So um, I, I protect, I'm very protective of my sleep and my, time with my family um, and just constantly experimenting and trying to get better at, at running a business. Yeah. What's one of the toughest things you faced on this entrepreneurial journey? Oof, these are good questions, Helen. I'm, I'm not quite sure how to answer these. Um, look, I think there's for, for, for any kind of an entrepreneur, there's, there's daily challenges, right? There's challenges that, um, you know, you, you think you know how to do something and then you figure out you've, that was the wrong way to do things. So I think, yeah, for me, there's just this daily reminders of you can always be getting better at something. Is there a biggest lesson you've learned on this journey so far? Yeah. Um, I think the biggest lesson I've ever learned, and this is a little bit off cuff, so excuse my language here, Helen, but my, my grandfather taught me very early in life. He said, there's, there's two rules to life. He said, rule number one is don't be a dick. And rule number two is never, ever forget rule number one. And I think, um, you know, the more I think about that, the more it comes down to just being a good person and being a good human being. You know, the right thing to do is always the right thing to do. And I think sometimes we can get distracted from that without even realizing it. So, you know, when we come back to center and question ourselves on whether this is the right way to respond to a situation or the right way to, you know, instigate a situation, is this really the right thing to do? Um, you know, it just comes down to being a good person and in turn being a good company and trying to do the right thing as much as you can. What would you say to some perhaps younger person who wants to pursue their idea and back themselves? Jump in with both feet and do it. It's, um, I think nothing, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And I think, I think the naivety of not knowing how to do something is, is a, is a wonderful gift because if we, um, yeah, I think well, personally, if I knew all the challenges that lay ahead, 
I probably wouldn't have started my own company. So, um, so yeah, jump in, give it a crack and, um, you know, hopefully nobody's going to die and you'll be okay. Peter Brennan, co-founder of Heaps Normal, non-alcoholic beer, craft beer company. Thank you so much for joining us on Build It, They'll Come. It's been great to speak to you, Pete. Thanks, Helen. You too. I really appreciate you having me on.